Sunday is that special time for us to get together and study the Word of God. We're so glad that you've joined us this morning for our presentation of Give Me the Bible. So go get your Bible, sit down, and let's study together from the pages of God's eternal Word right here on Give Me the Bible. Let me ask you a question this morning as we begin our uh, Give Me the Bible telecast. Are you a functional family? You know, sometimes people always raise that issue when you talk about perhaps maybe a family where divorce has occurred or maybe a child has gone astray. Uh, I don't really like that terminology of functional family because in reality, all families are functional. They just may not be functioning the way that God intended for them to function. This morning, we want to talk about that, and uh, we hope that you'll stay with us for the next uh, few minutes as we discuss this subject. We're going to call this morning on uh, Brother Kerry Clark, and Kerry's a minister over at the uh, Church of Christ in Athens, Texas. And uh, Kerry, I want you to talk a little bit about that, if you will, and we appreciate your being here this morning. Thank you, Dan, and I want to encourage you to open in your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 22. Proverbs chapter 22 and verse number 6, the Bible tells us, Train up a child in the way that he should go, and when he is old, he shall not depart, or he will not depart from it. There needs to be in families, in order for them to function as God wants them to function, there needs to be a stable value system that is instilled in our children while they're still young. And we realize when we read that proverb that a proverb is not an infallible rule. Uh, Solomon is not saying that uh, you can't occasionally have, even with a, a good set of parents, a child that turns out bad. Uh, we think about uh, Cain and Abel and the difference in their life. We have Abel, a very godly man, we have Cain that's not a very godly man. And so you, you look at it and you understand that uh, even with parents doing their job, there's sometimes a problem. But that doesn't mean that as godly people, we don't train our children the way that God wants us to. I ask you to open in your Bible to the book of Deuteronomy. And I want you to look as, as uh, Moses records these words in Deuteronomy chapter 4. And I want us to notice in verse number 2, you shall not add to the word of God. Now think about we're trying to build a stable family. We're trying to build it upon the word of God. And, and Moses told the children of Israel, you shall not add to the word which I command you, neither shall you diminish aught from it. And so obviously the Bible is telling us as parents we have a responsibility. A couple of chapters later in Deuteronomy chapter 6, God tells the children of Israel to instill these words into their children. Listen to this. Hear, O Israel, Deuteronomy 6 and verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. If we instill these principles in our children, we've got a great start for a stable environment. We want to be happy families. We want to have our home based upon the biblical truths of God's eternal word. And when you think about these values that uh, Carrie was talking about a moment ago, I think one of the greatest values uh, that we're challenged to adhere to is the love and honor that ought to be the basis for every godly family. And we're going to call on Chris Grota right now to share with us some truth based upon that particular concept. Well, thank you, Dan, and thank you all for tuning in this morning to Give Me the Bible. Uh, we want to talk about spending time with family. We want to talk about loving one another and honoring one another, but we're talking about establishing that through spending enough time to be able to teach those principles. And when you think about it, uh, how is a parent charged with the responsibility of rearing their child in the faith going to be able to do that if they're not spending enough time with them? You think about it in Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse number 7. You shall teach them diligently to your children all the ways of the Lord. You shall talk of them when you are, listen, sitting in the house. 
and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. So from the time that you go to bed at night to the time or the time you get up in the morning to the time you go to bed at night and everything in between, we are to be using those opportunities to teach and to model covenant behavior with our children. Um, and so, you know, I think about um, the Bible telling us in, in Psalm 127, verses 3 through 5, that children are a heritage unto the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. And, and as arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are the children of his youth. Happy is the man who has his quiver full of them. And I see people today where God has meant for children to be, a, uh, to be enjoyed and a treasure. I see people sort of putting up with their kids. They're like there's something to be endured or to put up with. And you can't teach this kind of love and honor when you feel that way about your relationship with your own family. No, my friends, we have to uh, understand what treasure we have and cultivate that atmosphere uh, within our children. There's a song that was sung in 1974, Cats in the Cradle, and it tells about a little boy being born. He grows up so quickly. Next thing you know, he's He's 10 years old, but the dad's too busy. We'll have a good time later, son. And then he comes home from college, and he doesn't have time for his parents, just wants to hang out with his friends. Then, of course, he gets busy with his real job in life, and dad wants to spend so much time with his son. His son is now too busy to spend time with him. And I think about how much time we don't really have, and we are really pressed for time to teach biblical values to our children. Let's think about this as we think about cultivating love and honor with one another. Chris, thank you. And isn't that really a sad commentary, though, in our world today? It seems as so many families are fragmented and divided from one another and really are not functioning as God wants them to. And maybe, just maybe, it's because we don't have the servant's attitude. And Chris, I want to I want to call you again and, and ask you to... Uh, speak uh, to this concept. Don't you think that we ought to have a servant's attitude and teach that attitude in, in our homes to our children and, and model that before them as well? Absolutely. And, you know, when you get over to Ephesians chapter 6, look at verse number 1 through 3. Children are to obey their parents in the Lord because this is right. Honor your father and mother this is the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. And we think about that in application to the Israelites living in their promised land. One of their successes to living in the land that God gave them was going to be the foundation of a society where children obeyed their parents and where parents loved their children that as goes the nation or as goes the home, so goes the nation. That's really kind of where that thought comes from. But then he says, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. When Paul says this is the kind of atmosphere that you need to cultivate in your Christian homes, I'm also reminded of something else that Jesus said when he talks to children not taking up their responsibility to take care of parents. You know, to honor your father and mother is more than just yes ma'am and no ma'am and yes sir and no sir. It's actually it could be applied to taking care of them in their old age. In Mark chapter 7, the Pharisees who were more about ceremonial washing of hands and pots and cups and all that kind of stuff came to Jesus and asking him, why are you eating with defiled hands? And he says, I'll ask you a question. Why do you transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? Moses said, Honor your father and mother, and whoever reviles his father and mother shall surely die. But you say, if a, fa if a man tells his father or mother, whatever you would have gained from me is Corban, that is a special gift to God or a gift to, to the temple, then you have relieved yourself. You're no longer uh, permitting him to take care of his father and mother, thus making void the word of God by your tradition. Something about that tradition caused people to think, Oh, I don't have to financially take care of my father and mother one day. You see, if we're to cultivate an atmosphere of love and honoring one another in the home, and we need to exhibit, uh, exhibit a servant's attitude towards one another in the home, it begins with the parents, and the parents reverse that, and they reciprocate that to their parents. Back to you, Dan. Well, Chris, thank you, and I hope all the parents are really listening this morning uh, because we set the stage for our family to either be functional or non-functional 
based upon the Word of God. And if you feel this morning that as we share these truths with you that your family isn't what it ought to be, then why not make the change and set the stage for your children? Because what they see in your home today will be the model that will be their home in days to come. You know, I think one of the things that really make us stable as a family, one of the great values is the fact that we can share humor with each other. There's so many people that believe that God is a de-emotionalized God, uh, that he has no emotions at all. I think God has all kinds of emotions and we're made in his likeness. Laughter is one of them. Solomon said that a merry heart does good like medicine. Why is it wrong to laugh or why is it right to laugh for the very Haynes? You know, years ago, I heard a phrase that said, a person without a sense of humor is like a wagon without springs. It's jostled by every pebble on the road. You know, a sense of humor is something that we can have in our families to help uh, in the difficult times, to help overcome the problems because no family is gonna have everything perfect. Not everything is gonna go right. And if you don't have a sense of humor, it's, it's gonna be a lot harder on you. You know, sometimes people, as Dan mentioned, you know, think of, uh, uh, they don't, they don't think a sense of humor is a biblical thing. I remember one time I was confronted by a lady who, who didn't like my sense of humor. And I, like I said, my sense of humor is kind of like communism. You know, everybody gets it, but not everybody wants it. Uh, she, she said, well, you know, you never see Jesus laughing in the Bible. And I said, well, you don't see a lot of human traits that Jesus does in the Bible. It's not recorded. But I know that he did it because he was made just like us. And human beings, they, they laugh at themselves. They laugh at things because it's a mechanism that we have for releasing stress. It's a mechanism we have for uh, reviewing ourselves. You know, humor is a way to receive feedback without, without breaking our back. It's a way that we can uh, get through problems. And Having a sense of humor in, in, in a family is so essential for that, that we have a commonality that we can share together. You know, the Hebrew writer talks about in Hebrews chapter 13 and 7 about obeying our leaders, and it's talking about the leaders in the church. But it says to do so, if to not to make them where their job is not joy, joyless, but happy. It says, let them do this with joy and not grief, as this would be unprofitable for you. Here it's telling them you don't want to make the, the leaders of the, fa of the church miserable because then they can't do the job that they need to do. And the same thing is true in the family. If, if children make their parents miserable, it's going to be harder on those children. If, if parents make their children miserable, it's going to be harder on them. That's why a sense of humor is so important because it allows us that, that grease that makes things better, those springs on the wagon that, that keep us from being faced by the problems. You know, there's a difference when, when people laugh together because it shares that joy with one another, and that's what we want to have in our families. Well, thank you, Barry. You know, if you're challenged this morning about whether or not uh, God uh, laughs, uh, go back to the book of Psalms and discover how many times. You can go to the commentaries. Uh, you can go to the concordance and find out how often the Bible says that God laughed or God laughs or the laughing of God. It will challenge you and it will amaze you that our God, as Barry said, made us like himself. God has pity. He has joy. He has compassion. He has anger. Hatred? Absolutely. Go back and look at it. It'll challenge your thinking. Hating the right things, not the wrong things. Brother Perry Cowan, uh, continue with this discussion for us this morning as we pursue these great values that we all ought to espouse in our homes. I'd be glad to do that, Dan. And, and folks, if you think God doesn't have a sense of humor, you've never seen an animal or a picture of an animal called a duck-billed platypus. Strange looking. Well, I want to talk about a, a happy family being one that is open and transparent with one another. At the risk of sounding like a politician, let me be perfectly clear. The Bible addresses this and tells us that we need to be open and transparent about problems that come up in our families. You know, if, if we don't deal with problems when they arise, they pile up. It's like, like garbage. 
if you don't carry out the garbage and just keep piling it up, what happens is it begins to rot. And anything that begins to rot begins to stink. And that's not what's going to bring happiness. So we need to be open. We need to be transparent. That doesn't mean we have to, to, to you might say, bear all uh, as on maybe uh, the Oprah show or the Jerry Springer show or, or even on Dr. Phil. Uh, a truly happy family has nothing to hide from one another because they openly discuss problems and help each other to work through those problems as they arise. They don't allow them to pile up and fester. Uh, because if, if they don't work through them, they have a likelihood of becoming a family like Cain and Abel had. They didn't work through the problems that they had and look what it led to. Or maybe like Jacob and Esau, uh, who had jealousy among them, uh, between them. Or maybe like Joseph and his brothers. You know, the Bible is filled with stories of rifts that occurred in good families, but in each case it was because they did not help one another through the problems that they had in life. Dan? Well, Perry, thank you. You know, I, I really believe that one of the ways that we establish a tremendous value system and, and build our mores upon the Word of God is by simply following the pattern that we have in the Bible, in the Holy Scriptures. And so we're going to call on Brother Jerry uh, Munholland again right now. And Jerry, uh, share with us from your perception of what really would be a tremendous value to the family to make us functional. Well, Dan, one thing that I would mention that would add value to your family is to be able to relabel tragi tragedy and tragic events in your life. Because tragedy and, and tragic events come to every person. And so how do we handle these? And how do we label these? And how do we work through these, these, these times of valleys and instead of being on the mountaintop at, at all times? I heard the story once of a, a preacher who always saw the good in, in every event that happened. And, and it, was, it happened to be that he was walking downtown one night and, and these couple of guys came and mugged him and, and robbed him and they took his money, and, and people at church had heard about it, and that Sunday morning when he came, and they wondered about how is he going to find good in this. So I asked preacher, heard you were mugged the other night. Can anything good come from this? He said, well, yes. As a matter of fact, I see a lot of good. He, he said, uh, number one is that they, though they took my money, they didn't take all that I had. And number two, though they took my money, they did not take my life. And number three, it was good that though I was the one who was robbed, I was not the one who did the robbing. And he looked and, and saw good in all events that happened. And we read in Romans 8, verse 28, we know that all things work together for good to them that love God and to them who are called according to his purpose. Now notice he did not say all things are good. But we can find good, and the good is found in this next verse, that we be conformed to the image of his dear son. Sometimes it is we go through days of tribulation, only to find ourselves that through that days of tribulation, we come through with days of triumph. Remember to see through the eyes of Job, Joseph, who said, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Can we relabel days of tragedy into days of triumph to add value to our family? I pray and hope that you can. Now back to you, Dan. Well, Brother Jerry, thank you so much. And, uh, you know, we continue to receive uh, accolades for our presentation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We don't seek the praise of men, but we're certainly glad to know that people are listening. We've recently received requests for this DVD that we've been offering on the program for a number of years entitled uh, Searching for Truth. And uh, we've received a number of requests from all over the United States. And uh, certainly you're welcome to write for that or call for it at the 800 number and we'll be happy to get it in the mail to you right away. It is free, it doesn't cost you at all, and we're happy to send it to you. 
It will help you. Maybe it would be great for you to sit down with your, your family and view this together. Uh, it would be one way of developing a greater closeness spiritually, and I hope you'll do that. You know, one of the great ways that we become functional in our families is by supporting and encouraging one another. And we're going to ask uh, Brother Stephen uh, Gumpert right now, if he would, to help us view that through the eyes of our Maker. Stephen? See, all buildings and all structures really are supported. And without that support, they would tumble and fall. You see a building being built and they have the scaffolding to support the building as they build it. In the same way, God's family has a support system. We have structure. God's word is the structure. And we, as Christians, are to support one another. Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 and 2 describe the support and bearing with one another. And when we read Galatians 6, 1 and 2, it says, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering you, lest, excuse me, considering yourself, lest you be tempted. It says, bearing, with, bearing one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. When we look at this idea, we see we are to love and consider one another. Hebrews 10, verse 24, it says, Let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. Love is certainly that bond of perfection which holds us together, and we should certainly understand we are to love one another. John chapter 4, 1 John chapter 4 and verse 11, tells us if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. And certainly a second aspect of that is we are to be good to our family, our family of God. And Galatians chapter 6 and verse 10 says, Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are the household of faith. That means we consider one another and we consider their burdens. And if their burdens are great, say they are overcome with sin, we have to be willing to take care of that sin. But it means we also still treat them like a brother. And lastly, we need to understand that no burden should ever be bare alone. It is our responsibility to bear one another's burdens because that is what Christ commands. Once again, reading Galatians 6 and verse 2, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Stephen, thank you so much for being on our program this morning and for those words of encouragement. Oh, how we need encouragement and how we need support. I'd like to say a word right now about our friends and our brothers in Christ in Ukraine. What a tremendous um, problem that they have faced over the last month. And uh, certainly we want to be praying for them that good can come from the tragedy and that we can all be made stronger. I'm so thankful for their tenacity, for their love for each other, uh, for the imposition and the death that has been caused by a tyrannical and horrible leader to invade a country as they have done with Ukraine. We thank you again for watching this morning. In our closing segment, our last but not least this morning is Brother Scout Betts, uh, who's going to discuss even further with us. Uh, just what does it take to make a functional family, Scout? God has designed the family in such a way that we are ones who work together. Uh, the saying goes, the family that prays together stays together. Uh, we might take that a step further. The family that worships together is headed to heaven together. We should be ones who are, are delving into Scripture to understand what God has for us and, and the way that He describes our families. When we look at the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, verse number 25, we see that we're not forsaking the assembling of ourselves as is the manner of some, as the text continues there. And notice that it's not particularly speaking of the assembly. We don't want to take that out of context here, but the assembling of ourselves will no doubt lead to an assembly of the brethren. When we begin to take our families to services to worship God Almighty, they begin to build relationships with one another, as we should in the body of Christ. Think about what happens when we miss the opportunity to serve the Lord, to worship the Lord when we miss the opportunity to partake in the Lord's Supper, to remember His death on the cross, we miss the opportunity to teach our children uh, what it means to partake of those, those emblems representing Christ's body and His blood. 
when we miss the opportunity to sing and be uplifted by one another, and let me tell you something, being one who sings out is one of the greatest ways we can teach our children. They're going to learn very quickly. And you hear the little kids, they don't have a pitch or a tune winning them, but they are singing out with all their hearts because they're watching mama and daddy do the same. We can teach them like that. But when we begin to miss those areas, what's happening to us? We miss the edification that is so vitally needed. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 20 through 22, we as the body of Christ are ones who are, should be building up and working together with Christ as our cornerstone. He is the foundation. And when they see us in services, when they see us in worship, making relationships, building upon them, they're going to learn. Parents, keep bringing your children to worship. They need to see that we make God a priority in our lives. Let's worship God as a family. Well, thank you so much, Gout. You know, I was driving down the highway the other day and I saw a tremendous big billboard sign. It had a picture of a, a family there, a mother and a father and their children. And inscribed on that sign, this simply said, yours for a limited time only. You know, our children are ours, but for a limited time only. God has loaned them to us. They're his children, but they're on loan from God to you and to me to help teach our children and to rear them in the way of Jehovah to make our family functional based upon the beautiful word of Almighty God. Fathers taking your children and leading them, as Solomon said, and teaching them the word of God, Deuteronomy chapter 6. I hope you'll take to heart this lesson and take it well. Thank you for being a part of our program. I'm Dan Manuel thanking you for joining us today. So please join us next week right at the same time, right here for Give Me the Bible. Sing that song of peace from the toils that by me it will bring release. Burdens will be lifted, not oppressing so. Showers of great blessing o'er my heart will flow. Sing to me, Sing to me of heaven, let me fully drink, drink of its golden glory, of its pearly gleam. Sing to Sing me, me when shadows of the evening fall, sing to me of heaven, sing the sweetest song of all. Sing to me of heaven tenderly and low, till the shadows of the rising swiftly go. When my heart is weary, when the day is long, sing to me of heaven, sing that old sweet song. Sing to me of heaven, let me fondly drink of its golden glory, of its pearly gleam. Sing to me when shadows of the evening fall.